Welcome everyone. Uh, as we just opened up the room, we're letting people arrive. Thanks for joining us today for the third installment in the Alice Conversation Series. We will get started in just a few minutes after people filter in. Thanks again. Aloha everyone, as you're filtering in, welcome to those who are just now joining us. We will be getting started very shortly. Thank you. Once again, I want to welcome everyone, including those who have just joined us. Um, we will get started momentarily. We still have a lot of people coming in. I just wanted to give the audience some information up front. Uh, first of all, this, uh, this webinar will be recorded. It's available for viewing later, as well as for sharing. Um, only our panelists are going to be recorded. Um, and I wanted to let you know as well, for those who may have um, any kind of uh, needs, we do have a live transcript function available. If you would like to hide that live transcript, um, you do have the option to do that as well. Um, you are, uh, we'd ask you also to please drop any questions that you have into the question and answer box. Uh, we do ask you to please reserve the chat for any comments or questions for presenters or anything related to the presentation. Um, we appreciate you not sharing large amounts of content, but again, please uh, feel free to share any comments any questions you might have, and any questions that you have for our panelists, please again put it into the question and answer box. We do also have a survey that will be coming out to you, and we welcome your feedback there. Any information that you'd like to share in greater depth or information, you can share on that survey. You can also email to impact at auw.org. And in just a moment, we will kick it off. Thanks again for being here. Okay, it looks like we have the majority of our, uh, the bulk of our audience has trickled in. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing you to John Fink, the CEO of Aloha United Way. Thank you, Lisa. Welcome and thanks everybody again for joining us. Uh, Alice, needless to say, is an important initiative to improve the economic stability for an estimated 59% of the vulnerable Hawaii residents. That is a staggering statistic. And frankly, who knows what it's gonna be like after we're finally done with this pandemic. 
This is extremely complex work crosses all sectors and necessitates a collective approach to resolving systemic issues. We're excited to present to you the third event in our Aulis conversation series. Today, we'll be focused on innovative legislation. Legislation and public policy are critical levers for impacting systemic change, and we must be the catalyst for changes that have to occur. We invite you to engage with us today by learning more about how your efforts can be combined with the power of other dedicated community members, organizations, individuals, and businesses to further the ALICE movement. Stay tuned for how you can get involved in community strategic planning for the future of ALICE. And again, thank you for being here today and for caring and sharing. I'd now like to get things going with Mr. Gabe Kravitz, who is with the Office of Consumer Finance and Government Performance at the Pew Charitable Trust. Gabe? Thanks so much, John. I really appreciate the invitation to join you tonight. Um, I'm gonna be sharing my screen uh, with slides and um, I'm so delighted to be here. Thanks so much. Um, well, <clears throat> thank, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak um, to all of you who are concerned about Alice households in Hawaii. Um, I get to start off this evening talking about uh, a really exciting um, transformational legislative change that's underway in Hawaii. Um, uh, lots of uh, credit is due to all, all sorts of cons community organizations, consumer advocates and consumers themselves, um, and lawmakers and regulators um, in Hawaii who've just passed this reform. So um, I know um, Jeff from uh, Hawaiian Community Assets is gonna be speaking in a bit. So um, I, I'm, I'm here to bring a national perspective about the payday lending issue and talk about um, the, the exciting way that Hawaii is really um, at the forefront of protecting consumers from harmful payday loans while uh, ensuring that people have access to small amounts of money um, when, when they need it, uh, when they need to borrow. So, um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, some the key state policy developments and how this is relevant for Alice families. Um, also, um, some of the lessons that, that um, were learned this, uh, over, the, over the last few years uh, as Hawaii um, took, took on the challenge of regulating payday lending. Um, and, and then I'll also just mention a few other pieces of research that um, might be of interest to, um, to folks on this call. So I'll start off by talking a little bit about who borrows uh, these types of loans and why. And I should start by saying Pew's been studying the payday loan market for the past 10 years. Uh, it's part of our family economic security portfolio. Um, and we, we, my, our team is uh, made up of folks who are looking at the different types of products uh, that families are using to make ends meet and uh, what policies are conducive to that and what, what policies are uh, barriers to that and, and when um, there are products especially that are, that are harming consumers, what can be done about that? Um, so um, let's start about kind of our, taking a step back to look at the, the national uh, landscape for the payday lending market. Um, 12 million Americans take out payday loans each year and very relevant to the conversation about Alice families, Typical borrower is making $30,000 per year, which is $15 an hour. Um, borrowers are more mainstream than you might think. Um, you, to, in order to borrow a payday loan, you have to have access to a checking account um, and a source of income. So borrowers are going outside of their banking relationship um, to take money at very, very high interest rates. Uh, in Hawaii, uh, before reform, typical payday loan interest rate was 460%. And as, as I'll talk about in a moment, that's far higher than necessary to make this type of credit available. Um, the, one of the major questions uh, that we wanted to address with our research was why are borrowers using these loans in the first place? And what were their experiences like? Um, seven in 10 uh, uh, consumers in our nationally representative telephone surveys that we conducted 
uh, said that they were using the loans to cover recurring everyday expenses like their rent, their mortgage, their utilities, et cetera. Uh, th there were some assumptions that, you know, there, uh, and oftentimes you'd hear um, in the policy conversation that borrowers were um, not, uh, you know, you know, there's there's debates about financial responsibility and all that stuff. But in, in fact, what's, what we're seeing here is that people are um, people are struggling to make ends meet, and they're taking out a small loan of a few hundred dollars so that um, they can cover their recurring expenses. This is, you know, this is not. Um, frivolous spending. This is truly people on the edge um, struggling to make ends meet, trying to responsibly pay their bills, um, but uh, that's actually not what ends up uh, happening with the payday loan. Um, a typical borrower takes out a loan of $375 and they end up paying $520 just in fees, so far more than they received in credit in the first place. Uh, and, and the reason that that has, so the, the loans are advertised as two week products, but people end up getting trapped in debt for on average five months of the year. Uh, so the two week petty loan looks appealing uh, from, from what borrowers have told us in our surveys and in focus groups, it looks really appealing because it's a, not another bill on the pile. Um, typically borrowers have a, a lot of uh, bills uh, that they're, they're struggling with. And the idea of a two week loan seems really appealing, um, but the, the borrower doesn't know that they're actually gonna be trapped in, trapped in that loan and um, having to reborrow in order to pay their recurring expenses in two weeks when the loan comes due. And the, and the lender has access to the borrower's checking account. So we quickly started to see that at, at the heart of the problem with payday loans is that the payments were unaffordable. Uh, to pay back a loan in just two weeks in one lump sum takes up 36% of the typical borrower's next paycheck. And if you're struggling to make ends meet, uh, like so many Alice uh, households are, you, you can't sacrifice a third of your paycheck and still pay your rent or your mortgage, uh, your utilities and groceries. And so these types of loans are available in about two thirds of the states. So, um, that's, that's the big picture. Um, interestingly, one of the things that we heard from borrowers um, is that they've been told no by a lot of, uh, a lot of people. Uh, and being able to borrow is appealing uh, and, that's, and, uh, and access to credit is important. But so there's a sweet sensation of being approved for a loan, but there's also a very sour sensation associated with payday loans because uh, they because borrowers feel that they've been set up to fail. And that's actually how the business model works. Um, our, our research and, and lots of other national research has shown that uh, the vast majority of revenue for the lenders comes from borrowers who are who are taking out um, who are in debt for months and months of the year, not just two weeks. So if so if the two week uh, loan really was advertised and and uh, was as was as bar, ex, bars experienced it as it was advertised, uh, the business model would crumble and uh, it wouldn't work. So, the two week payment unrealistic. The the payment that takes up a third of a borrower's paycheck uh, totally unaffordable, and the prices are far higher than necessary to make this type of credit available. And that and that I want to talk about that next. Um, so, the debate. Um, when, as these loans were being authorized through the um, 80s and 90s um, and into the 2000s in Hawaii, I believe it was in the middle of the 90s that this was first authorized in state law, um, was a, a, the, the policy debate was about should, um, so if, if borrowers who have damaged credit um, sh should have access to, to loans um, or, or shouldn't they? Uh, and, and that's a very hard question to answer. Uh, with research, um, and it, there's a lot of policy um, questions that are baked into that. But um, I, what's important is that that's not the only question. Um, it's not a question of should the loans be unregulated and uh, have interest rates like they did in Hawaii at 460% or no credit at all. So um, we set out to answer that question and, and see that actually that's not the, that's a false choice. So uh, we, uh, used a case study from Colorado 
uh, where, they, where uh, that, that, that kind of by chance happened in 2010, where advocates in the state had been pushing and pushing for many years to cap interest rates in their state. And uh, the, they couldn't agree. And finally, after some tough negotiation, uh, they decided to um, basically um, look, give borrowers more time to repay, lower the prices, and restructure the loans. Uh, and what, ha what ended up happening is uh, there was widespread access to credit. And so, um, so like, so as I said, to to borrow three hundred dollars for five months in Hawaii today, a, a borrower paid five hundred and twenty nine dollars just in fees. What we learned from the experience in Colorado was that the very many of the very same companies were charging uh, far, far less for the to the same borrowers with similar um, demographics and credit risk, um, uh, but they were only charging one hundred and seventy two dollars for that same amount of uh, loan and the same amount of time. Um, the The payments were much more affordable instead of in Hawaii like they are today. Um, taking up a third of a borrower's paycheck, Colorado required the loans be paid back in installments um, and take a small share of their paycheck. And uh, interesting enough, um, unlike the kind of doomsday uh, rhetoric that uh, we saw around the legislative process, um, the loans remained widely available. Now there was some consolidation and uh, some lenders went out of business, others uh, served more borrowers at each store and there was widespread access um, and major savings to consumers as a result. And so this is just a quick rundown of, of the key uh, elements of Colorado's reform. They eliminated the conventional two week payday loan. They replaced it with a, a installment loan that was due back over months. Uh, loans were uh, structured with affordable payments, um, equal installments that paid down over time, uh, they had much, much lower pricing. It was still high APRs because of the nature of the size of the loan. So the small fees and the shorter terms meant that the APRs all in were higher, but uh, they were able to cut prices by uh, three times and maintain widespread access to credit. Um, and so we, we showed what that looked like um, here on this map. And you could see that we could we can make the case that there's still widespread access. So that's the before and after story that we were able to see with research and bring the evidence to this conversation. Um, and so when Hawaii lawmakers were started grappling with this over the years, uh, this story was uh, was I think important because there there were um, policymakers that were legitimately concerned with the question of access to credit. Well, you know, if, if Hawaii um, regulated these loans, would uh, people have options to borrow? Would, they, would all the lenders close up shop and, and leave the state or would borrowers still have access? And so that was, that, that was a important policy discussion that happens, it really does happen in every state legislature that has this type of market. Um, but the example from Colorado shows that it's possible to bring about reform in a way that maintains widespread access to credit. Um, so that's what Hawaii did. Um, it took a number of years. Um, community organizations, including some that you'll hear from tonight, um, uh, engaged borrowers, um, educated legislators. And ultimately, after um, years of uh, education and, uh, and advocacy, uh, Hawaii adopted uh, reform that uh, basically looks a lot like what Colorado did. Since Colorado took action in 2010, um, Ohio passed reform in 2018, Virginia passed reform in 2020, and Hawaii um, also um, is now gonna be regulating this market um, in, a, in a more fair way starting in January of 2021. So basically the kind of key components of the law are that all loans are gonna uh, have to be made by uh, licensed lenders. And if a lender is uh, offering loans in Hawaii without a license starting in January, that loan will be null and void and community organizations and, and borrower advocates and borrowers can um, basically uh, have a, new, have a new, newfound power that those loans can be voided. Um, all loans are gonna be required to be structured 
and affordable installments. Um, minimum loan terms of four months or two months if it's a very small loan of less than $500. Um, the core pricing um, for these loans that go up to $1,500 are it's a 36% interest and a $35 maximum monthly fee. And the total costs are capped at 50% of the loan amount. Um, and so just to give you a sense of what this means for uh, the budgets of Alice households. So before uh, this reform, so today, while, while we're waiting for reform to take full effect, it, a borrower who takes out $500 over four months is paying $700 uh, just in fees. And after reform, that loan cannot cost more than $158. So that's major savings uh, uh, that consumers are going to be seeing and families are going to be able to put back into their budgets, put back into uh, the local community. So I think I wanted to spend just a, a moment that I have left to talk about some of the key lessons from Hawaii's legislative success. Um, first of all, um, it was really important to bring diverse perspectives, both borrowers, um, businesses, responsible lenders who could say that, yes, we want to, um, you know, if, if, the, if the rules are fair, we can, we can and we will lend in the state. That was a really important voice. Um, and also regulators. Um, the uh, Commissioner of Financial Institutions, Iris Ikeda, uh, was a key uh, vocal champion of this. Uh, and the two policymakers in Hawaii um, that led the charge were Senator Roz Baker and Rep Representative Aaron Johansson, who are the two committee chairs of the relevant committee. And they really dug into the data. Um, and they, they, I think they really appreciated hearing and addressing those specific concerns to be able to make, ensure that their colleagues, anybody who had, had concerns about access could be reassured that this type of reform would still ensure that people have access to loans if they're in, uh, if they're in a financial bind. And the last thing I would say is it took time and trusting relationships and persistence. And so a lot of credit is due to the lawmakers and the community organizations who led the way. Um, and so uh, with that, <coughs> excuse me, with that, I just wanted to quickly flag that I have colleagues across um, our, our portfolio uh, that's focused on family economic security that are doing research and, and looking at policy initiatives around retirement savings, home financing, so the lack of access to small mortgages, um, and alternative arrangements like land contracts um, and, and chattel loans for manufactured homes. Those types of um, alternative arrangements are something that we're starting to take a look at with uh, early research. And also on issues like land use and single family zoning, which we know um, uh, contributes to residential segregation. And, and I'm sure we'll hear more later in the program about Hawaii's um, crisis on, around housing. And then we also have colleagues looking at student loan borrowing repayment and, and making it easier um, to, for, for people who've taken out loans and, uh, to pay for college to pay those back. So um, I'll wrap up there and I'll look forward to hearing from the panelists and also be available for any Q&A after. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Gabe. We really appreciate that. Um, and thank you to everybody who has joined us so far. Um, we have a lot of people here today and we're really excited. Um, and we wanna thank especially our legislators and advocates as well who are, who are here and very interested in helping to move a lot of these issues forward. If you have any questions, any comments, anything you'd like to know more about, I invite you to please put it into the Q&A box. Um, or if you'd like to chat, um, you can certainly drop that into the chat as well. For now, I'd like to first ask you folks uh, to share a little bit about yourselves. So I have put a poll question up here. If you can let us know which industry you primarily work in. And we'll give just another 30 seconds or so. Okay. 
And it does look like we have a good representation. About half of you here today are in the nonprofit industry. So thank you so much. Um, as well, we're really happy to know that we've got about 11% uh, from our government representatives. We have a good showing of people who are uh, working with us, 9% from the business world, 13% from education. We've got some financial sector representation, um, as well as the philanthropic community and community members as well. Um, this topic is something that is incredibly important and takes a lot of collaboration across sectors. Um, and with that said, I want to turn our next uh, presentation over to Jeff Gilbreth, the Executive Director of Hawaiian Community Assets, to share some more. Jeff. Uh, mahalo, Lisa, um, and aloha, everyone. Again, I'm Jeff Gilbreth, Executive Director of Hawaiian Community Assets. Uh, it's an honor um, to be here uh, alongside Aloha United Way, Pew Charitable Trust, uh, Hawaii Appleseed and HCAN. Um, uh, just appreciate all you folks. And really my presentation today is more around where does innovation uh, intersect with legislation and the work that we're doing uh, here at Hawaiian Community Assets. And so I'm gonna be sharing with you folks really, um, you know, Hawaiian Community Assets is a community development nonprofit. And there's not a lot of us in the state of Hawaii, most nonprofits are social service agencies, but we're really focused on um, increasing uh, and sustaining the economic self-sufficiency for Alice and Below households. Uh, under our work with uh, the Alice cohort and Aloha United Way, we, we leaned into the idea of launching financial, a financial opportunity center in, in Honolulu. And it's really around increasing income and assets uh, of Alice and Below households with, uh, with some service interventions. Um, the center itself targets Alice and Below households, but a focus on families and this is a national evidence-based model that was put forward by Local Initiative Support Corporation. Um, and we've replicated it on Oahu. Initially, we had uh, developed a financial opportunity center in Hilo um, and Aloha United Way's support actually allowed us to bring this to, to Oahu. Um, so what have we done over the last you know, three years with Aloha United Way and the Alice cohort? Uh, we established this financial opportunity center in 2019 um, and this center concept gained a bunch of traction and Lisa joined us along with funders from LISC, uh, Hawaii Community Foundation, the University of Hawaii in January 2021 to announce uh, the nation's first and only statewide network of these centers, um, uh, one place in each of the counties here in Hawaii. Uh, under the funding for, from the Hawaii United Way, uh, these bold uh, results um, are just what we did on Oahu. And it was meant to be a pilot to see what we could do. Um, 306 individuals have been served with bundled services. So that means financial counseling, uh, income support. So think public benefits, grants and loans and career coaching. Uh, and what we found is that 20% of the individuals who received these bundled services actually increased their income, uh, built assets uh, or both and started moving out of Alice um, though, uh, the process and the steps to take uh, are much more long-term. Um, for every dollar that Aloha United Way has put into our organization, uh, we have leveraged $16. We've gone out and secured $16 in additional support. This is primarily in money that has gone to our loan funds so that we can provide uh, affordable loans uh, and grants uh, to individuals uh, and households who are Alice and Below who don't have access to our local credit unions and banks. Um, in the last three years, we've been, we've been working on some policy, uh, uh, some work, some legislation. Uh, Gabe had shared uh, the great work on policy, uh, the payday loan reform. I have to be completely honest, our organization was not very active in the legislature in this last year because we were focused on making sure Alice and Below households still had a home to go to. Um, but, I, you know, we did some down payment work uh, on this, I would say. We, we did some seating with Gabe and, uh, and other folks. Uh, the Affordable Homeownership Revolving Fund got passed. This is a, this is a companion basically to the Rental Housing Revolving Fund. Uh, Hawaii Habitat for Humanity and Gene Lilly over there um, were the champions who led this fight. Um, we were part of it, but Jean and her team took it to the finish line. And now we have uh, a revolving fund similar to the Rental Housing Revolving Fund that'll focus on Alice and below households for homeownership. Um, if you didn't know two other things that passed, uh, there's a state retirement savings task force 
uh, that is in place. Um, one of Gabe's counterparts is actually engaged with us there as well as folks from AARP. And we're really looking at how can the state set up a retirement savings program for those workers who um, don't have access. And so this would definitely connect house and blow households. And something that's really near and dear to my heart, uh, I started off in this work on financial literacy for children. If you didn't know, the Department of Education is now developing standards for financial literacy grades nine through 12. It will be a credit course of 0.5 credit, but it's the start. Um, in terms of federal legislation and where that inter intersection happens for our financial opportunity centers, uh, we put together a package called our financial opportunities for families. Um, a matter of services and products, but really this came out when the expanded child tax credit passed at the federal level. And so as you can see, folks can walk through our doors, Allison Blow households can walk through our doors, they can gain access to that tax credit if they don't already have it and have, haven't been filing their taxes, but we can also do more. We can help them set up a savings and spending plan. We have a match savings product. So if they save $1,000, we can match $2,000. That can be used for a whole host of different things, but we're encouraging childcare. And we're working with partners like Patch to be able to help folks uh, apply for childcare tuition assistance. If you didn't know, um, you know, about one third uh, of our, our local family's income is going towards uh, childcare uh, for, for Alice and both households. Um, in terms of future plans and where we're kind of uh, have our, our, our eyes set um, as a result of uh, AUW's investment in us is really in three buckets, adopting and adapting new financial tools, accelerating increases in income assets, and I would say housing stability, uh, and improving our efficiency in this work. Uh, one of the tools that I just wanted to share with you folks, and you get kind of a sneak peek at this. So this is called the Cliff Benefits Tool. We're working with the Federal Reserve uh, Bank of Atlanta. Uh, to access this through our financial opportunity centers. And what this graph here is showing you is uh, a single mother uh, with two children uh, who's in a minimum wage service uh, position or job, uh, making the decision to uh, become certified as a nursing assistant. I mean, you can see 2001 to 2022, essentially what, what this shows is a drop in income where maybe she goes to half time uh, in work. Uh, but gets her certification within that year and then where the, that income is at annually uh, before taxes. This slide, what this shows you is that um, as uh, this client is moving through this process to increase income, um, the gray bar really shows um, uh, the self-sufficiency target uh, for the family. And the gap that you see between the yellow line and the gray line is made up with public benefits. This shows you the public benefits that that nursing assistant would have access to as a single mother, two children, to make sure that we're slowly and gradually taking away the public benefits uh, from the family uh, as they increase income. So there's not a cliff effect. So they don't just drop off entirely. So we are uh, working to get this uh, into the state of Hawaii. We will be focusing on uh, uh, professions in healthcare, construction, um, finance, finance uh, real estate, uh, and nonprofits. Um, this slide just simply shows you, um, you know, our push to get more grants and loans to Alice and Below households uh, is critical in their housing stability. And we've shown this, and this slide shows the dollar of grants we've dispersed and loans deployed um, to our Alice and Below households uh, and over the last several years, but what that does in terms of Ohana families gaining housing stability so that they can stay in the home. Um, our goal is in next year, we're looking at about uh, putting out about four and a half million dollars across all of our network uh, of FOCs um, and 2023 to increase that over 5 million. In the next two years, we're looking at 1500 Allison Blow households being able to be uh, housed stably, but also help increase their income and assets uh, in this work. Um, and so that's really where, where we're headed uh, on this front. Um, in terms of what you folks can do who are on this call, what I would say there's two things. Um, that we offer um, a financial health benefit. It's free for you folks as employers to be able to refer your staff, your clients to the Financial Opportunity Center and they can gain the uh, access to these services and products. Um, and we're also uh, lifting up what Aloha United Way did. Made an investment in our organization that was multi-year it was a major commitment, um, but what this has done, as I said, is it's, it's now established a network across the state doing this work. And 
to give you an example on Maui and on Hawaii Island, we have now moved to a second phase on our scale up where the counties there are committing uh, multi-year uh, public dollars, public funding out of their line item budgets uh, toward this financial opportunity center model uh, that's being matched with uh, private funding. We don't have that for Oahu yet. We don't have that yet for Kauai, but we do have it in place for Hawaii Island and uh, Maui as our um, as a proof of concept. Um, and last, you know, it's not just about um, dollars or uh, making sure your folks are coming over to us to get these kind of services. I think in terms of engagement and where innovation and policy and legislation uh, come together is in this last year, what we saw was there was a sense of urgency finally on making sure that we have an economy here locally that works for everyone. These things that Gabe talked about, the, the, the legislative wins that we've achieved this year didn't just start this year. It's been a multi-year process. We need to maintain this sense of urgency with our policymakers and our decision makers. And we need to be leaning into this idea about solutions. I think as COVID made uh, the economic pain our families are, are experiencing more prevalent or in the face of our decision makers and policymakers, we saw action happen. Right. Uh, on the flip side of that, I would say there's things that you can do as an employer um, uh, or, uh, you know, you folks as nonprofits who have uh, folks in the door um, paying community members to participate in community engagement activities. Maybe there is a, a paid time off uh, opportunity for folks to be able to advocate at the legislature. I think if we stay front and center, the families who are Allison below. Uh, talking about the need, I think we can continue this sense of urgency and continue to move progressive. Uh, economic policies that'll help Alice and Below households and really all of Hawaii. Um, and so that's all I really have for you folks. Happy to stay on for any questions you may have. Um, and this is my contact information if you want to get in touch with me. But mahalo, everyone. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much. Um, and we have uh, some comments in the chat uh, talking about the how exciting the work is. Um, and how uh, it does offer some hope. And to echo that, it really is a matter of the innovation and the innovative strategies that we all in the community um, have within the, the um, areas that we serve. Um, and disruption is necessary if we're gonna make some change. So thank you for providing those great ideas um, and the great work that you're doing. Um, I think the information is so compelling, uh, really makes a case for all of us. Um, for those of you who have ideas, suggestions, questions, or comments, please go ahead and drop them into the chat. Or if you have questions for our panelists, we will be addressing those after the presentations are through. Um, so please, again, use that Q&A box to put your questions. Um, next, I would like to introduce Deb Zeisman, the Executive Director of Hawaii Children's Action Network, and Gavin Thornton, the Executive Director of Hawaii Appleseed Center for Law and Economic Justice. Good afternoon. It's lovely to see all of you. So many folks, I can see all the participants. I know you can't, but it's nice to see lots of friends. Um, Gavin and I will be co-presenting, so we are doing a bit of a tag team um, because our project has been a policy hui for the last three years. So it is Hawaii Children's Action Network, Hawaii Appleseed, and then Focus, which when we began was its own entity and is now a part of um, Hawaii Appleseed as well. So first, just to introduce you to um, my organization, um, both of our organizations are focused on macro level policy and systems change. We do think tank work, we do a lot of coalition building, we do community organizing, and we both have a deep commitment to the idea that many of the issues we're talking about today cannot be solved with individual level services and programs, that there are systemic changes that we need to work on and policy change. So that is our lens uh, that we both drive through. So for my organization, um, our vision is that our state is the best place in the nation to raise a child and that all of our kiki are safe, healthy, and ready to learn. And I'm going to then turn it over to Gavin. Thank you, Gavin. Appreciate that. Hawaii Appleseed has uh, a very similar mission, um, not necessarily focused on just children, but really we're a research and advocacy organization working to promote policy and systems change to create a Hawaii where everybody can thrive, where everybody has an opportunity to achieve economic security and fulfill their potential. And we know that those 
types of that type of vision, that vision of everybody here thriving is broadly shared in Hawaii. Most of us aspire for this to be that kind of place. But the reality is that our economy is severely out of balance with significant barriers, impeding the ability of many people to care for their families. We're so excited to be a part of this um, work because the AUW's Alice report did such a tremendous job of showing those problems, of highlighting the fact that so many of our working families can't afford to meet their most basic needs. The original report issued in 2017 found that nearly half of our households didn't earn enough to cover the cost of a basic needs budget. I just heard John earlier say it's now at 59% based on where we're at, the, the pandemic. So here's the question. What does that basic needs budget look like? And we'd like you to take a stab at, at answering this question. What is that, what do you think that annual survival budget is for a family of four? We'll take a, a little break here, take a stab. Is that enough time for folks? Do we have those, those results to share? All right, so here it is. Um, all right, impressive. Uh, the 43% uh, the of folks nailed it. Um, so that you've been you've been doing your homework. You you read the report, obviously. So great job, AUW folks. It's working. Um, so this is it. This is a, a a visual on what that basic needs budget is, and it's just that. It's basic needs. It's no frills. It's childcare, food, transportation, housing, healthcare, and the means to communicate. And the Alice report demonstrated very clearly that so many of Hawaii's residents are being forced to make hard choices. Do I pay for healthy food for my family or do I pay the rent? Do I pay for childcare so I can go to work when that work barely pays for childcare? I mean, these are the hard situations that our, um, our neighbors in this state, even, even folks like, just like you and me are facing. And when we look back over the last 50 years, we can see why people are where they're at why they are falling further and further behind. And this series of charts shows a few things. One, since 1980, low and middle income earners have seen their hourly wages increased by only one or two dollars. Well, high earners have seen massive increases, over $12 an hour equivalent. This isn't because people are contributing less to their communities or our economy. In fact, Hawaii's per capita GDP, gross domestic product, has increased by over 40% over the last 50 years. But the benefit of that increase has not been shared equally. Low and middle wage earners have only seen 11 to 13% of the GDP increase show up in their wages, while high earners have seen close to the full measure of that GDP increase reflected in their wages. The economy that we're building together is leaving so many people behind and on the bottom floors and try as they might, people are getting left further and further behind. I think one of the most frightening examples of this is what's happening with rents relative to wages. And if you look at that bottom graph there, it shows over the past 50 years, rents have increased by about $1,000 per uh, annually. The annual rents have increased by, by about $1,000. If you're a high wage earner, that's no problem you're earning $25,000 more than you were way back when. But if you're a low or middle income uh, wage earner, your increases in income haven't nearly kept pace. And if you're desperately trying to make up that ground as so many Alice families in Hawaii are, it's not as simple as just going back to school to get a better education. I think. Jeff shared that, that wonderful example of what can be done on an individual level. But unfortunately, opportunities like that are relatively rare. 
over the past 10 years or so, we've gained low wage jobs and lost high wage, wage jobs. During that time, there was a 29% increase in the number of low wage jobs and a comparable reduction in the number of high wage jobs. Most of the jobs that are in our top growth occupations, our 20 top growth occupations, don't have any educational requirements. And 35% of, of our jobs in those top growth occupations pay less than $15 an hour. So even if you wanna go back to school, even if you wanna get that education, once you get out, the jobs just aren't there for folks. And the impossibility of this situation is so easily lost on higher income families. Um, for high wage earners who've seen their incomes increase dramatically, as low and middle wage earners incomes have stagnated, it's really hard to see the problem. I mean, their income has been increasing more than enough to cover increases in expenses. For them, it's like a layup, it's super easy. But for low and middle wage earners, it looks more like this. They're starting too far away from the hoop because they have low and stagnant incomes. And the hoop's actually getting higher because the expenses are going up. The game for them is becoming impossible. And really what we're trying to do is create the equal playing field that everybody deserves. Everybody should have an equal shot at success. That's really a metaphor for what the policy HUI has been doing with this Alice work, working to readjust the rules of the game so that everybody has a fair opportunity to win, to thrive, to put points on the board. Because in this game, like we both individually and collectively are far better off when everybody in our community is racking up all the points that they can. And one last thing um, before I hand this over to, to Deb, I just wanna emphasize that this isn't just a Hawaii problem. This is, this is a national problem. And so we shouldn't be just comparing ourselves with the rest of the US. We should be comparing ourselves with places that are thriving, with the kind of places that we wanna be. And, and these figures are from the Organization for uh, Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD. They demonstrate how the U.S. is faring relative to many other countries. You know, despite having extraordinary resources as a country, we still have a very high percentage of working households that live in poverty. 11% of our working households live in poverty. 16 countries in the OECD are doing worse than us, uh, like China, India, South Africa, we're tied with Canada. 26 countries are doing better, countries like Korea, Sweden, Hungary, and many others. Our levels of income inequality are some of the worst in the world. We are in the top 10, which is not the place you wanna be in the top 10 for. And these issues are not because we as a people are less industrious or less intelligent or even less luckily, lucky and people in other countries, but they're due to policy choices that we're making. Relative to other countries, the US ranks relatively low on public social spending as a percentage of GDP. We're in the lower half of these countries that are looked at, at the OEC, by the OECD. So I'm gonna hand this over back to Deb uh, to talk a little bit about what kinds of policies can help us be a place where people can thrive. Thanks, Gavin. So while Gavin paints a fairly bleak picture, I get to um, talk about some of the possible solutions and how we are addressing it and how you can get involved as well and what you can do. So um, these bullets are from the World Bank, taking a look at six policy areas that we know help people thrive and that have been extremely well researched and worked repeatedly around the world in reducing inequity. Um, this is not to say these are the only paths forward, but these are some of the most heavily researched and proven to be effective policies that we should take a look at. So again, our organizations are very research backed. And so that is where we put our time um, and effort as well is where we think we will see the biggest impact. So again, early childhood development, nutrition, universal health coverage, access to education, getting money in the hands of lower income families, rural infrastructure and progressive taxation. This is around the world. So our HUI over the last three years, what we have been working on here in Hawaii is affordable early learning and quality childcare, progressive taxation strategies, living wage, 
a variety of cash supports, and we'll get into some of these, and working on affordable housing. So before we move on, we wanted to poll all of you uh, from those policies that we have been working on, and some of you I know also watching have been working on. If you had to pick one, as we start thinking about 2022 uh, and beyond, which policy change do you think would have the biggest impact for our families in Hawaii? You only get one. I know that's hard for many of us. And Lisa, do we have the results? Okay, good to see. So um, I would say close to a tie on affordable housing and living wage, like fairly evenly split um, with the rest kind of falling behind. So it's interesting to take a look at. I think that's actually often mirrored when we are out talking to families in the community about what, what are the biggest strains that they're feeling on, on the family. And it makes sense because when you look at that budget that, um, that Gavin was presenting, the real problem that most of us are facing is it's either not enough money in our you know, bank account or our wallet. So how do we have more, more money to stretch it? And the largest household cost um, is, is rent or a mortgage. So again, I think those we're looking at both ends and how do we um, move on. So I'm going to delve into um, three of these policy areas a little bit and then um, talk about what we're doing. And we can also, we're happy to answer questions about these different policy areas. So an area that my organization and Appleseed have worked heavily on for honestly decades now is really early care and learning in Hawaii uh, which child care um, and preschool is the second highest cost after after housing for a family it is entirely unaffordable um, infant care does cost more than UH tuition at the moment and there's often very limited support um, for families except sometimes what we see or what we do see now is there's financial support for lowest income families, but really we're talking about most of us in the community that are struggling to um, make it to the end of the month with any kind of change in our bank account, right? As John said at the beginning, we're talking about 60% of the population now. So again, we often have programs and services for our very low income families, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the, you know, most of us, kind of our middle, middle earners. One of the largest challenges that we are facing, oh, sorry, I'll go back one second. One of the largest challenges that we are honestly facing in the childcare and early learning sector right now as we think about how to expand access to childcare so that families can work, so that kids can get um, great living is that, um, you know, head up on school is that honestly, our workforce in this area is among the lowest paid. They are certainly Alice, if not below. Um, that you know, you can see at the bottom, our hourly wages for folks working in early care and learning are abysmal. We do not have folks wanting to go into this field. Even sometimes it's challenging with this is, these are often people with a bachelor's degree or a master's degree and very low wages. Our workforce um, needs to more than double to serve family need in our state. So that is a challenge for us. And I think one of the things that our teams are strategizing on is how do we lift uh, wages for those who work in early care and learning without charging families more, right? Because again, families are already paying exorbitant amounts. We actually wanna charge families less, but pay the folks in the workforce more. So that is a complicated um, situation. Okay, next slide, Gavin. Um, the next area that we focus a lot around is uh, tax fairness. That what we see here, and this is true for most, um, most of our country, is that our lowest income household pay the highest proportion. Uh, something is not really right there in terms of thinking about tax fairness. How are we paying for these things? What is more equitable? Um, how do we just have a more equitable and fair solution? So I think our teams have proposed a number of things. We coordinate the Progressive Tax Coalition. Um, they're often 
difficult things. Folks hear tax and don't like it, but I think it's really on, on what is more fair. And then the last area to give you a little bit more information is on earned income tax credit. So often called the EITC. This is one of the best strategies that we have seen to lift children out of poverty. It's it, um, associated with better health, better education, increased earnings later in life. What this does is put more cash in a family's um, wallet, right? I think we are seeing the same thing. It is new still with the federal child tax credit, which is a kind of similar structure of giving families money. Um, the, the child tax credit is on a monthly basis. The earned income tax credit at present is annual when you file your taxes. But again, thinking of strategies to get more money into um, the hands of low and middle wage workers. So next in Hawaii, what we are working on is uh, number one, making it permanent. What we have right now is an earned income tax credit that sunsets. So we want it to be something that stays um, as part of our law permanently. And then making it what's called refundable. So that means even if you don't owe taxes, you get money back, if that makes sense. Because otherwise folks said, oh, maybe I get to a point where I pay zero in taxes, that's fine. But this actually provides additional cash support. That's what, that's what refund, I didn't understand that until I got into this work, what is refundable? So, <laughs> see, Gavin's like, oh, tax friends. So that's what refundable means, right? Where not only might you not be paying any taxes, you're also getting additional cash support. So again, making it permanent, making it refundable. I think we'll also probably be working on the child tax credit at the federal level, in addition to a state earned income tax credit, putting more money into, um, into folks' wallets. Uh, we've seen with the child tax credit, it's going for things like food and school necessities and childcare. That's what families are putting that money towards like right away. So um, how we do our work, again, both of our organizations do a lot of community organizing. This is my organization. We are building a network of advocates for children and families. Uh, we're at 8,000 plus. We hope you might consider joining us. We train parent and family leaders. So we have an in-depth civic engagement program. Um, our enrollment is open for our new cohort starting in October, probably virtual due to the COVID spike, but um, teaches folks how about leadership, about civic engagement, about how to be how to be involved, right? Regular people. So again, trying to help regular people have a voice and know how they can speak up on behalf of themselves and their families. And we do a lot of coalition building. So we bring together many of the organizations that I see in the participant list today to try to bring those organizations together to work collectively with a strong, solid voice um, to advocate on behalf of the children and families that we serve. Oh, this is our Parent Leadership Training Institute. I'll give you a link to that. But again, the, the motto of that is transforming parents who care into parents who lead. Those are some of our recent um, alums back when it was face-to-face. -face. <laughs> and this is um, Appleseed and our collective work just for the last six months, because again, we do a lot of mobilizing as well. So uh, we mobilized almost 5,700 emails to elected officials on some of these issues. We had 15 different news articles and op-eds. Um, lots of story collection where we're working on making sure that the stories of Regular families, uh, regular people are elevated to some of our policymakers. Often we know those folks because they're working three or four jobs, don't have time in their day to, to um, you know, leave that third job and go to a hearing. So how do we convey and bring stories um, of what's, what's impacting families to our lawmakers? And then we really enjoy legislative testimony. So even in a virtual space, uh, we had eight priority bills this last year collectively and had 1,600 pieces of testimony from not just us, but obviously lots of folks in the community. And that's our work. So for all of you wanting more information, uh, there's a link or a really cool QR code you can snap with your phone. Uh, it has links to the data pieces if you're a data geek like myself and Gavin and want to see the sources. It also has our various um, social media and for both of our organizations, ways to sign up as advocates, as volunteers, like to get involved if it's something that you're interested in um, advocating on after today. Because we always are saying, less talk and more action. And we're happy to answer questions.
Thank you so much. Um, with that said, um, we appreciate all of the information and for all of you being here today um, and your interest in this. Um, and with all of this information that's been presented to you, we're really interested in hearing from you on what your ideas and recommendations and suggestions are. So first, again, I wanna remind you to please put those questions that you have into the Q&A. Um, and I also want to ask you another polling question. Um, we are interested in knowing which of the following Alice impact areas are you most interested in taking legislative action on? That could be talking to your representatives, that could be community organizing, that could be submitting testimony. But of these Alice impact areas that we are working on, what excites you and how could you apply your experience, your passion, your community towards? And because everybody has good ideas and lots of passion for these subjects, once you've had a chance to vote, we also invite you to please drop into the chat a reason why you selected this area. Is it because you're already doing work there? Is it because you see the most need? Is it because you feel like we've got critical mass already? Let us know in the chat what you think and why you chose this. And if you also have ideas about policies that should be implemented in Hawaii, go ahead and share that as well. Of course, this is a space for us to have a conversation and to uh, communicate with each other on what we would like to see happening next. All right. A lot of people have had a chance to vote, so. Uh, we do see that a little over a fourth of you are very interested in taking action on safe and affordable housing, followed by financial stability and savings, quality and accessible health care services, and then a good split between technology, continuing education advancement, and nutrition and food security. Uh, of course, with all of these options, it is very hard to decide uh, what you are most passionate about. Um, and so again, for the reasons that I said, if you've got other thoughts and suggestions on policies that should be implemented and or why you chose what you did, please go ahead and drop that into the chat and we can uh, continue the conversation here. Um, while we do that, we are going to open it up to our panelists to ask some questions. So I am going to... Uh, open it up first uh, for some questions that have come in so far while we've been talking. Uh, we did have a question uh, first uh, that came out uh, asking uh, during Jeff's presentation. Uh, Jeff, so, and anybody else, given the legislative victory on payday lenders, and I suppose this, I'm sorry, a question for Gabe as well, but can the next initiative be to control pawn shops? Uh, the question is uh, that they are essentially collateral lenders, and for someone pawning their assets, whether it's jewelry, tools, musical instruments, etc., uh, they need to purchase their pawned assets back at a substantially higher cost than was paid, um, which is essentially the equivalent of interest. So are there any moves to control pawn shops? Uh, I'm not aware of any, uh, Lisa. Um, I think it's a uh, it's it's a good suggestion. I think overall, those type of things like payday loans, um, pawn shops are considered alternative financial services. So whatever we can do legislative wise to make sure families have a pathway to get to our local banks and credit unions so they have access to affordable capital, I think is critical. But um, Gabe, I don't know, on the national level, is there something that uh, you folks are working on? Well, um... Jeff, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, one of the things that we're working on at the federal level is making it easier for um, uh, and more accessible for, for folks who have checking accounts already with banks and credit unions to get access to small loans that would be um, six or eight or even 10 times cheaper than, than alternative financial services directly from their bank. Banks can do this at much lower costs um, because uh, of a whole host of of advantages that they have. Um, so that's a really important um, piece of the puzzle as well. So thanks for bringing that up, Jeff, and thanks for the question. Thank you. 
Uh, we had a question on um, for Deb with regard to childcare. If wages for childcare workers are so low, how are the the high costs for childcare justified? Where does that, that money go? Good question. So the the issue, honestly, with younger children, which is where the cost comes in, is like for infants, for example, you can only have you need to have one staff person for every three to four children, as opposed to within the DOE, right? My kids are in DOE. You can have, I think there's some head folks on here, um, 20 some children, right? One teacher for 20 some children in a classroom. But with infants, the ratio is much um, tighter. So that, that's honestly where the cost goes, right? You're, you have three or four babies with one adult. Um, that, that's often some of the costs. You also frankly have, we're not subsidizing in the childcare sector things like facilities as opposed to like in education, right? You have government money going for, uh, for our classrooms and for supplies and things of that sort. Thanks, Deb. Uh, we had another question. Um, it was said that a family of four needs to earn almost $91,000 to pay for basic needs. So for that family to have a, a living wage, they need to earn nearly $44 an hour. Is that realistic, especially for a single parent family? Anyone want to take that question first? Gavin, you and I can tag team. I mean, to yeah. me, this is the question. I think as Gavin discussed, we often talk about let's help folks lift themselves up by their bootstraps into a better job. But in our community, we are going to still have lots of folks we need working in service industry, uh, you know, jobs that are never going to pay $44 an hour. And so I think we need to grapple with that, that this is not about lifting an individual to a better sector, better paying job. We have to think about how to infuse additional cash. To me, that's things like the child tax credit or the earned income tax credit, universal basic income, things of that sort, while also dramatically dropping some of the costs. Like we have not invested as a community in substantial affordable housing and frequently what we call affordable is not affordable. <laughs> so I, to me, it's both. I think it's like both of those pieces. You need to think about other ways of putting money in someone's bank, whether it's, um, you know, we're never gonna have a $44 minimum wage, right? So. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think it depends on what you mean by realistic. Um, is it politically realistic that that could happen tomorrow? No, um, but if you look around, I mean, look at the tremendous resources that we have in this country and this world. I mean, there's really no excuse for um, people to go out there and work full time and not be able to make ends meet. That just doesn't make sense. Is it going to be really hard to move us from where we're at to that place? I think so. But is it doable? Yeah, it should be. But it's going to require some major, major shifts that I don't think a lot of people are, are ready to, to make. And that's gonna be the really hard part. Thank you. Anyone else have thoughts on that? Okay, we had another question that came in as well that's, that's fairly well related, um, asking what the reference for the high wage job threshold is um, and link to that in the chat. Uh, low wage jobs are those that are defined as paying less than the wage needed for two workers to affor afford that household survival budget. And again, that was the chart that was shown that had uh, the, the, the basics. And for two uh, household earners, um, as, as was just discussed, uh, $44 an hour is needed. Medium wage jobs are for those that allow two workers to work two jobs um, and uh, be able to uh, uh, make ends meet. The number of medium wage jobs decreased about 4% since the last Alice report came out. And the number of low wage jobs uh, decreased uh, I'm sorry, increased by 29%. So in other words, we now have more low wage jobs, low wage jobs account for the largest number of jobs in Hawaii. So the 
quite unfortunate scenario right now is that with even two earners working full time, working jobs that are most common for households in Hawaii, uh, it is not enough for them to meet that household survival budget. Um, and to answer the question once again, high wage jobs do allow one worker to uh, be able to afford the, the threshold, but the number of high wage jobs has decreased by 28% since last since the last report was published. Um, so not trending in the right direction. Um, but a question kind of related to that uh, question was tax credits aren't cash. How can we get more cash into people's pockets? Uh, Gabe, would you like to maybe take that from some uh, national level and, and initiatives that you've maybe seen elsewhere and followed by anyone else on the panel? Yeah, um, well, I think one of the interesting things that we've noticed during the pandemic um, is how kind of in two, in, in two ways, there, there's a large drop in the volume of payday loans. Um, and that, that most likely had to do with um, both uh, more support, um, you know, I, I, we heard a little bit mentioned, uh, I think Deb mentioned the child tax credit, um, but also, also um, un unemployment insurance. Um, so there were all sorts of um, supports that were going out um, in response to, to the pandemic and economic fallout. Um, and at the same time, there were also um, lower consequences for um, missed payments. So there were a pause, pause on student loan payments, um, and uh, uh, also other things, you know, uh, uh, forbearance uh, on mortgages and, and rental relief and whatnot. I know that there's been there's been lots of reporting on on, on many of this this kind of slow uptake and hiccups that we're seeing on on, on many of these programs. But I think it goes to show, you know, interesting that um, uh, that those two those those types of uh, policy consequences did end up. Um, reducing the volume of of, pay, of petty loan borrowing. So that, that, that's just an interesting thing that we're, we've been tracking over the last uh, year or so. Thank you. Jeff, maybe, or Gavin? I would just add, you know, some some tax credits are, are essentially cash. I mean, the earned income tax credit is a good example. The changes made to the um, federal child care tax credit I mean, the fact that people are getting them on a monthly basis um, is very helpful instead of just getting that uh, one time per year shot. But also, I mean, this is why um, we are, are supportive of and advocating for an increased minimum wage, just because tax credits alone, um, you know, aren't going to solve that problem. Um, people need higher wages. You can't just legislate, um, like uh, you can't snap your fingers and say, okay, everybody needs to pay a living wage now and it happens, but you can do things to correct. Um, and, and so minimum wage is one of those things that we think is really important because in terms of like the number of dollars that are getting into people's pockets that they're then able to use to support their families and spend and support the economy with. Um, you know, increasing minimum wage is far more powerful than some of those tax credits. Yeah, yeah and I would just echo get to Gavin's point, you know, refundable tax credits are cash uh, in folks' pockets. And I think one thing that's on the table uh, that you heard Deb and Gavin talk about is making the working family tax credit at the state refundable and uh, to make it uh, permanent uh, rather. And so um, I think, um, you know, that's, that's one thing just to echo there. And I'll say, you know, in terms of COVID as we were doing, as we were lending to families um, who had nowhere else to go, um, we were giving them $5,000 uh, cash in their hand. And um, they were spending on all the same things that again, Deb, uh, Deb Gavin, Gabe all talked about. It was uh, housing payments, it was childcare, it was food. It was, um, you know, was, so when folks get cash in their hands, they're making the right decisions. And, um, you know, I think we need to get over uh, the stereotype that Alice and Below households uh, don't know how to prioritize their money. In my experience, they're prioritizing extremely well uh, to be able to take as little as they have and meet the means that they, uh, the needs that they have. Um, you know, I, I, to that point, I just want to make a, a, a comment as well. But Deb, I didn't know if you had something to add on. I was just gonna say there's also good research that shows um, 
putting that extra cash in folks' uh, wallets on a regular basis. So like if you can do monthly payments or court, like having it be regular and expected is, is um, more beneficial than a, not that folks will turn down a one-time, uh, you know, windfall of $5,000. I think that helps, but people do treat it differently as well. If you know that like every month I'm getting this extra money, it's treated more like if you got to raise at your job so that you can count on. I know I can pay the rent. I know I can buy the food. So expect it. I think making sure that it's something that folks can count on is, the, is one of the important pieces. Thank you so much for sharing. And we're going to allow people to keep dropping questions into the Q&A box. Um, but wanted to take a, a second now uh, to talk about some of the next steps for Alice. Um, because as we've talked about today, there is plenty of work for all of us to do, and it's incredibly important for us to be on the same page together. So once again, thanks for being here and uh, thanks for being part of this innovative conversation. What, of course, we're looking for right now is the way that we can help change the future, and we wouldn't be here if we didn't care about that. Of course, the Alice Fund was developed to help nonprofit agencies develop and implement impactful programs. And this has been happening for three years, of course, of which um, uh, three of our agencies that have been part of this project are here talking today. It's something that requires collective impact. The programs are not it on, them, on their own. Those five conditions that we need to make that collective impact happen are to one, like we're doing here today, make sure that we have a common agenda. Step one is making sure we're all talking about the same thing, we have the same understanding of the problem and we're sharing the vision for the change. Whether that's taking place in our own perspective and in our own landscape, that's fine, but we know what we wanna do. And in this case, it's helping to make sure more people are surviving and thriving. Next, we're looking at shared measurements. And this is finding out ways that we can not only collect data, but what that data is and how we can not only manage our performance, but share accountability amongst ourselves. We share that accountability through mutually reinforcing activities. These may be totally different approaches, but they're coordinated together through a joint plan of action. By continuous communication, meaning we are talking, we are building trust, we are meeting regularly, and we are cooperating together, we help lead this path forward. And finally, the fifth component of it, which is the role that Aloha United Way has been playing, is the backbone support. This is not only financial support, but using resources and skills to help convene and coordinate organizations to participate together. The collective impact theory is that none of us can do it alone. And intuitively, instinctually, we all know that. However, it is such a complex problem and there are so many dynamics at play that we can make progress in one area where something else is pulling us back. However, when we're all on the same page using those five principles, the idea is that collectively we can push the system across that tipping point. The idea being we are stronger together. So although we've been investing in programs, resources, advocacy to help move the ALICE issue forward, what we're looking at out of the ALICE report are these impact areas here. One is making sure that people have access to quality health care. Two, making sure people have safe and affordable housing. Also improving nutrition and decreasing food insecurity, which is an issue that we have seen spike uh, this past year. Access to technology and digital equity is something, again, that has been highlighted more than ever before, along with the critical component having sufficient financial stability and savings, having access to adequate and quality childcare and educational opportunities, and being given opportunities for continuing ed education and career advancement. So if you are waiting for your, your invitation, here it is. We would like you to join the movement. What that means is a lot of things, but now that you've been invited, we would love to have you get involved. The table that we've built or the metaphorical table that we've built um, has been primarily in development for the past three years, looking at a lot of the, the solutions, the programs, the ideas that we've been talking about for the past three months during this series. And what we're looking to do now is to welcome your participation to join us at that metaphorical table. We are seeking meaningful community engagement. That means that we wanna hear truly about what is going on, what is working and how you see change happening. We really wanna invite deeper engagement by a variety of system stakeholders. That means in addition to our grantees who have done phenomenal work and made incredible impact, 
we want to talk to more people because that systems map is huge and it's not going to get solved by any one of us. It will be solved by all of us, but not on our own. And we need trusted collaboration with local organizations and businesses so that we can help realize that collective impact, that we can engage audiences in new and equitable ways, and then we can develop meaningful, measurable, lasting change. This is the landscape of the cross-sector participation that we're looking at. It is, of course, bigger than any one of us alone, um, but we do need to engage academic and educational institutions. The United Way system is a huge part of it, and of course, the ALICE research is a critical component that keeps that uh, the, the data uh, together. We're looking to local, state, federal, and other public agencies and government to participate with this and to understand the issues at a deep level. As we sometimes hear, people think that it's just about getting a new job or a better job, and it's really not just about that. Um, and when the system, when people do not understand the system, it's hard to make that change. We're also looking to healthcare systems because social determinants of health, which include access to housing, access to education, access to quality food, are impacted. And of course, our very trusted, very close nonprofit community and community based organizations that we have been working with for many years. The strategic planning goals as we move forward. This uh, community conversation series that we've had this summer has been really designed to try to whet your appetite for this work and see where and how you can plug in. What we want to do is make sure that we are engaging residents and stakeholders statewide. This is a statewide program. Aloha United Way may be based on Oahu. We may serve the residents here, but it does not end at our island. Um, it is something that we all need to be talking about. The process is intended to be community led. We are working um, with, we are engaging some facilitators to help us with a very community led process for strategic planning. And those of you who have participated in this series are on our list to, to be involved, uh, to be invited to participate. We're looking to address support in accessing those Alice loops that are in the systems map. We wanna increase engagement and participation opportunities. So for example, if you were not a grantee of Aloha United Way, but you are someone who cares about this issue or works with clients that are Alice, we want you there. The idea is to focus on activities that have a lens constantly on diversity, equity, and inclusion and giving voice to Alice so that they have a chance and an opportunity to share what is really going on and what impacts can be made. We want to make participation opportunities accessible for all Hawaii residents, regardless of where you live. Um, of course, we will still be doing that online during this time. Not only does it make sense, but it's one of the rare opportunities that we have uh, for everybody to participate no matter which island they live on. And finally, what we're going to do, working together, talking together, and making plans together is to create a compelling plan that we can use to take actionable steps forward. Some of the real critical nuts and bolts of this work are building subcommittees. We'll be having quarterly multi-sector working groups. We're going to invite you to participate in those that will be aligned with our ALICE impact areas to help improve knowledge uh, among our st stakeholders. We wanna use these committees to develop some meaningful solutions around these ideas that we've looked at um, and where these needs are most critical. Of course, just like I was saying with collective impact, developing shared measurements is a critical part of this plan. Uh, we intend to, like I said, collect that data in whatever way that we can measurement, measure it and use it to move systems forward. Uh, part of that is constantly analyzing, monitoring and evaluating those, those strategies and activities and working with leaders within the system to continuously learn, adapt and improve. And finally, part of that is building public will for Alice. And that's partially what we're doing here today. Understand, support, um, get behind training and educational opportunities so that we can address what's going on for Alice households, whether it's economically, health or social needs related. Um, and what we'd like to do is continue to keep sharing the word. That means we'll be doing presentations, webinars, conferences, listening sessions with members throughout our community. The timeline looks like such. Here we are in August and we're off and rolling. Um, throughout the rest of the year, we're going to be piloting some more stakeholder convenings, working on those community goals, talking statewide, and looking at what those Alice project ideas could be. Again, this is much bigger than uh, grantees that are being funded by AUW because there are so many more entities throughout our system that are involved in this. 
we want to invite you to please complete your post event survey that'll be coming to you via email. We will also post it in the chat. We'd like you to in indicate what you're interested in, what excites you, where your ideas are, what you got out of this and what you think could happen to help move the work forward. Um, we would like to use your information if you're interested to invite you to join us in those impact area work groups. There's a lot of work to be done and we are really excited to have you part of it. And so on behalf of Aloha United Way and on behalf of all of the hard working nonprofits that have been part of this, we wanna thank you for joining the Alice Movement. Um, with that said, do we have any other uh, questions or comments for our panelists or our panelists, um, any information um, or thoughts that you have before we close? We did have one question come up um, for anybody on our panel who um, is um, uh, brave enough to answer this, but uh, the question was, our local legislature does seem to be highly resistant to transformative change, especially if it disturbs the status quo. How are these strategic goals and committees going to catalyze more change than we've seen in previous leg legislative sessions? And while our panelists maybe formulate some answers on that, here's what, what I'll say. Um, it is really critical that these um, ideas and these initiatives are coming from the community. We need to work hand in hand and we need to invite more people to participate and understand. The data is there and sometimes it does take data to change minds, um, but it also sometimes takes actionable steps and programs. And with the incredible opportunity that we have right now with uh, focus on federal aid coming in, we are in a really ideal situation um, to be able to pilot new ideas. Um, and I do think it's about conversation and it's about continuing it. Um, and again, looking back to what the, the kind of loop of, of the collective impact theory is. Uh, but I wanna turn it over to our panelists and see if maybe perhaps you have some thoughts or ideas on that. Sure, um, I'll, I'll definitely go. I mean, um, I think the question makes a great point. Like we gotta pick up the pace, um, the, the, change that Gabe described was a change that took many, many years um, and super fortunate to have champions in the legislature that were willing to push it forward this year. Um, and uh, it's gotta get easier <laughs> because we've there's so much to be done. And the only way it gets easier is that more people like get engaged and I think understand um, you know, that question about earlier about what's possible is $44 an hour possible. Um, I think people need to just understand the possibilities, what the possibilities are, and not be so attached. I think we're all kind of attached to the status quo. And um, we need to really like, kind of wake up and look around and say, you know, this isn't right. Just like, you know, people that were grappling with slavery so many years ago, like so many people were just kind of okay with that. We look back at it now in horror and there's gonna be a time I guarantee that we look back in horror that we have allowed people to struggle in the way that they are struggling right now when we collectively had the resources so that people didn't have to do that, so that people could live rich lives in which they're all thriving. We just got to get enough people there. And if I, you know, Gavin, just off of one of your points you actually shared earlier is that we've been operating, the system's been operating uh, from a perspective of scarcity of resources. And anytime that happens, um, you see division within even nonprofits uh, that are working, but definitely um, uh, within our, all of our sectors. Um, and it always becomes a question of no can, no can, can't do that. But there's really, there is an abundance of resources that we just are not tapping. And that this idea that there's a scarcity of resources is not true, it's not accurate. It's how do we, uh, to Deb's point, uh, make sure that we're making the type of investments that we should be in the Allison Blow households and the communities they're, uh, they're in 
um, because there is an abundance. We're, we're, we shouldn't be functioning from a place of scarcity mindset, but abundance then brings us together. We become more collaborative. We make good on what Lisa put forward and what Aloha United Way has fought for, which is this collective impact model. You know? Also, I'd just like to magnify one of the comments too. Um, Charde in, in the comments talks about dismantling systemic racism. I mean, absolutely. Like it's, you look at the data, it is clear as day that that is a problem that we need to address. That, um, you know, certain, certain groups of folks uh, are just in much worse situations. And it is because of this historic racism that, and, and all these policy choices that we have made as a society that has created that. So really appreciate that. Charlie, thank you. Yes, echoing appreciation for that um, that point and those those answers. Um, we have had a few other questions um, come in. Um, we are right at our our three thirty time, um, and with that said, um, we don't want to end the conversation here. We really want to give people the opportunity to keep contributing um, and keep conversing about it. Um, in the chat, you'll see a link to a survey, which we invite you. If your questions were not answered, um, we want to have the chance to do that for you, and we also want you to share what other feedback and thoughts you may have. So please do take, take a chance, uh, take an opportunity to answer the survey questions. It'll come to you via email as well, um, but you can open it up now. Um, we have some, some chat going on about um, affordable housing. And yes, that is, um, you know, even our poll said today, one of the primary areas of interest for people. Um, so with that said, I want to thank everybody for being here and for being part of this uh, this conversation today. It's something that, again, we don't want to end here. We want to keep it going. And so in order to continue on with that um, and to be able to plug in in your area of interest and expertise, um, we'd really like to invite you to uh, participate. Um, with that said, we're going to close this out with a short little video. Thank you again for being here. Thank you again for your, your conversation. Thank you for your interest. Um, and we re really look forward to seeing your responses in that survey. Thank you all so much.
Thank you again, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, yes, that was a video produced by Aloha United Way and everything will be available online. The link is in the chat. You can view it again. You can share it with others. And again, please make sure uh, to um, keep in touch with us so that we can keep everything rolling along. Um, Aloha and thanks for joining us.